Welcome to the Healthcare and Complicated YouTube channel. If you have not uh, subscribed to the channel, please hit that uh, subscribe button so you don't miss any of the great content. And going straight ahead to the guest today, today we have Toby Cosgrove, which is a former CEO and the president of Cleveland Clinic and is also an executive advisor. Toby, how are you? I'm very well. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you too. It feels a long time since we last met at the Global Healthcare Week in Abu Dhabi, but actually it was just a couple of months back, isn't it? Yeah, it's been too long though. <laughs> What have you been up to? Well, I think one of the main things that I'm up to is I'm very interested in AI and how it's going to affect uh, healthcare. I think it is uh, going to revolutionize how we take care of uh, patients and you bring better care, cheaper care to people all over the world. Sure, that's certainly the very hot topic at the moment. But uh, let me uh, take you back, if you don't mind, from your experience at the Cleveland Clinic. I was actually in Ohio before IMSS 24 back in March, and I had a visit with a delegation from France, and I met some of the senior folks there. I was very impressed because it's very big, as you well know. One thing is kind of making a picture in your head, another thing is going there. Uh, they, they even have their own zip code, as you, as you all know. And it's astonishing. Over 80 buildings, uh, 51 buildings in the main campus, 20, uh, 12 million square feet. is astonishing. Can you give us a bit of the background and maybe a bit of history from your experience at Cleveland Clinic, please? Yeah, it's very interesting that the Cleveland Clinic started almost 100, a little over 100 years ago. Uh, and it was formed by three doctors who had fought together in World War I and thought that they could do better working together rather than having independent practices. <clears throat> so they started the, the Cleveland Clinic that time, and it went through some kind of rough periods uh, through the, uh, the Depression, World War II, um, and uh, they had, but gradually uh, these uh, entrepreneurs really put their personal finances uh, at stake to make it happen. Uh, and um, 50 years ago now, when I joined the Cleveland Clinic, um, it was one hospital and about 200 doctors. And now it is 23 hospitals on three continents, uh, 83,000 employees and um, 6,000 doctors. It is a little difference, right? Yeah, it grew like crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's the funny dimension. It's really big. And it's astonishing the work that you're doing on the ground. And I saw the setup, not just the hospital, but also the operations that you have around from the when the patient arrived. And you have that mantra and motto, patient first, which is our, a kind of experience that. And also I have some um, workshops there with some of the senior clinical management and everything. And the, you got a very humane, if you like, uh, approach, which is, a, that's what healthcare really needs. And uh, a Cleveland Clinic has these three pillars, the education, clinical care, and the research side of things. How would you see, uh, we mentioned artificial intelligence, which is, well, the, the very hot topic. Where do you see artificial intelligence and perhaps generative AI is making the, the biggest impact on each strand, education, clinical care, or even research. What are your views on that? Right. So <clears throat> healthcare, I think it's got three problems right now. Uh, the first problem is that um, there are uh, hospitals are struggling financially. Uh, hospitals in the United States, for example, are uh, running at a margin of one or two percent. Half of them are running in the red. Uh, there are 460 hospitals right now that are at the verge of bankruptcy. The second problem is there's a major shortage of health care providers, uh, nurses, primary care physicians. There are 2 million unfilled health care jobs in the United States right now and 10 million across the world. Um, the third problem is that there's this incredible explosion in knowledge. Um, 
And there are 1.8 million medical articles written a year, uh, which makes the total amount of knowledge in healthcare doubles every uh, 75 days. Um, so it's very hard for anybody to keep up. Now, uh, right now, I think uh, AI can begin to make a major difference. Uh, it, for example, uh, there are uh, huge amounts of administrative work that are repetitive uh, and can be replaced uh, by healthcare or by AI in healthcare. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how, uh, how we make nurses and doctors more efficient. And I'm sure you've seen uh, ambient listening uh, devices where um, and um, looking uh, after doctors' inboxes. So they're helping them be more efficient. And there's a lot of things right now that are going to help nurses become more efficient. And finally, uh, as far as the explosion of knowledge is concerned, it's going to be impossible for people to keep up them, themselves, but all the latest information will be provided uh, almost instantly on any condition for people all over the world using AI. I can't read it all uh, and keep up with all the journals, but you can get the synopsis of it uh, from AI, which is a huge advantage particularly for places around the world uh, that don't have a established uh, medical system. Uh, I think it's going to be enormous opportunity. Yeah, fantastic. You mentioned so many important things there, the shortage of stuff and, and also the, where AI really tap in into the repetitive tasks and everything. What are your views about the, is this big controversy about ethics, danger? Do you see... AI being a threat in, in to some extent or, or, or not really? Well, I think it has the potential for uh, being a uh, threat. I think that, but right now, I think potentially the advantage in healthcare particularly is so great that you, you can't uh, avoid it. Uh, uh, and you must, uh, and eventually we will figure out how we put guardrails around the potential problems, uh, but hey, we've got to take advantage of the, the good things that it brings us, uh, and the sooner the better uh, for people and for expenses. Mm, fantastic. What do you think really healthcare really needs? Because we talk about fixing the problems, fixing the health systems, policy, lots of different things, but what, in, in lemon terms, what do you think healthcare really needs? I think uh, we need to figure out how, how we get uh, care to many people who are not cared for currently. Um, and that's going to be a lot of virtual care. Um, and it's going to be uh, preventative care. Uh, and we have to figure out how to take the cost up uh, and uh, make people more efficient. Uh, right now, it's very labor intensive. Um, and we have to take advantage of the technology to reduce um, the amount of uh, people that are concerned and the cost that goes with that. Mm. Fantastic. You mentioned the cost. I, I, I could shift the conversation into the, the disparities, of course, the gaps in social economical um, uh, social economical groups without enter any politics. But what do you think? We're talking about the U.S. healthcare system in here, which is highly fragmented, but also involves is a, is a big machine, as you, as you well know. What do you think we need in terms of healthcare reforms for the future to better serve people and closing these gaps in disparities in, of the of the delivery of healthcare? Well, first of all, we've got to get everybody to have some sort of coverage, um, and we still have several million people that don't have any insurance coverage. And then uh, clearly uh, there is so much is determined by the social determinants where you uh, where you were born, where you live, what food you eat, where you went to school, what kind of job you have. Much of that uh, is very important. For example, in, in Cleveland and in Boston as well, various areas, there, there is a 20 year difference um, simply on where you live. Um, in your life expectancy. So, um, and I think that we're going to have to have uh, collaboration uh, amongst lots of different agents, agencies 
to begin to do this because this is not uh, something that healthcare is going to be able to solve in and of itself. Um, it's going to require um, lots of uh, organizations. Let me give you an example. Uh, Cleveland, for example, has a very high incidence of lead poisoning uh, in kids. And um, that winds up causing uh, your neurologic development to be retarded, uh, which means that you're going to do worse in school. You're going to get a worse job. You're going to have a worse uh, uh, salary, um, and you're not going to live uh, in as good a place. Um, all that is social determinants. So what the Cleveland Clinic did is it partnered with United Way and gave them $50 million uh, to have start a campaign to get rid of the lead in paint and pipes, etc. cetera. Um, and that is, I think, a good example of working with uh, other agents, agencies. Toby, you mentioned that word collaboration, which is a bit of a cliche, but is a true essence. Without that, nothing is uh, possible. I could just keep asking you questions all afternoon, in, in your case, all morning, <laughs> because you are in Ohio, I'm in UK. But uh, I try to keep my uh, interviews nice and short so people can actually listen to them instead of doing a record for one hour and people go off to other things because everybody is busy. Toby, it's been fascinating. It's really nice to see you in, in Abu Dhabi, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you soon when the opportunity arises. Is there anything else that you want to add? Anything whatsoever? No, just thank you very much for the opportunity. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much, Toby. It's, it's really nice to see you. I'm, I'm going to wrap up now to all our viewers and listeners. Make sure you subscribe to the, uh, to the channel and also follow Toby's great work, and I'll see you next time. Yeah.